On Saturday, August 12th, the Chicago Black LGBTQ plus group will make history as they commemorate the 30th anniversary of their original 1993 entry into the Blood Billigan Parade. That year, the denial of their original request and the public conversation that followed was talked about from Ted Koppel's Nightline, USA Today, to WVON Radio. The dialogue between the Defender, Chicago Defender, Blood Billigan Charities, and the Ad Hoc Committee of Black Lesbian and Gays, their parade title, ushered in a new era on the acknowledgement and inclusion of LGBTQ citizens. This year, the Chicago Defender and the Blood Billigan Charities are again on the leading edge of inclusion by inviting those original markers back as many in the nation's political environment seek to silence LGBTQ voices and freedom. In the summer of 1993, on the vibrant streets of the south side of Chicago, a historic moment unfolded. Members of the ad hoc committee of proud black lesbians and gays took a bold step forward, marching proudly for the first time in the nationally recognized Bud Billigan Parade. For months, this courageous group had been applying pressure on the parade planning committee, advocating for their right to be included in the 64th annual parade. That August in 1993, their persistence and determination paid off as they were finally granted permission to march. Okay. This year, I had the privilege of sitting down with members of the original march that took place in 1993. We met on the 30th anniversary of the march, on the eve of the 94th parade, where they were to be honored by again marching proudly. My name is Shelton Watson. My pronouns are he, him. I was a member of the ad hoc committee of proud black lesbians and gays that participated in the Bud Billiken Parade in 1993. Hi, my name is Stephanie Betts and I worked for the Commission on Human Relations at the time that this parade went on. I participated as one of the members wanting to stand up for my community. Hi, my name is Jano. In 1992, I was coming out of a meeting called Yahimba. It was a group of African-American lesbians and I was talking to my friend Karen Hutt and I said next year we should be in Bud Billiken Parade. So at a meeting of activists she made me stand up with her and she had the application and she said it was her idea to talk about this last year. We're gonna, I'm gonna fill this out. And the room went crazy. My name is Michael O'Connor. I was charged uh, with Karen to uh, hope with the media response. Hi, I'm Lisa Marie Pickens. Um, my pronouns are respectful. As long as you say them respectful, I'm good. Um, yeah, I was a proud member of the Ad Hoc Committee of Proud Black Lesbians and Gays and uh, excited about being here um, 30 years later. Known as the largest African-American parade in the United States, the Bud Billiken Day Parade is a testament to the rich cultural heritage of Chicago's South Side. Held on the second Saturday in August, it winds its way through the historic neighborhoods of Bronzeville and Washington Park. Dr. Martin Luther King Drive becomes a stage for celebrities, politicians, businessmen, civic organizations, and most importantly, the youth who are at the heart of this celebration. My first memories of uh, this uh, parade were as a child. Uh, and so every kid who uh, wants to be in a parade, like Gilligan, some organization is usually represented by the demographics of the largest African American parade in the United States. It was a, a big deal. I mean, if you were in the neighborhoods around the south side of Chicago when Bud Billiken was happening, they were empty. Like, where is everybody? It, went, it was like mainlining black culture. I grew up watching the Bud Billiken parade on uh, the fire escape of my grandmother's building on the corner of 43rd and King Drive. And it was like, 
that is a place where you would have the largest concentration of black people on the south side of Chicago. And it would be an excellent idea. However, are we ready for that? I've never had an interest in being in the Pride Parade. I've never been in the Pride Parade. But this meant something to me um, in terms of being in the parade that had such historical significance in our community and where we had been before, right? Not not necessarily known, not necessarily seen, but we had always been there, right? In the early 1990s, the United States grappled with LGBTQ plus rights amid significant societal changes. The introduction of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 1993 encapsulated the struggle for acceptance, prohibiting openly gay and lesbian individuals from serving in the military, sparking debates on discrimination. Concurrently, the community fought the devastating HIV AIDS epidemic and legal battles against discrimination while advocating for equal rights. Hate crime and violence remained a pressing concern, marking the early 90s as the beginning of a journey towards greater LGBTQ plus equality in the United States. Two things we had on my block, a group of gay women that I heard the first word, the term bull dagger. And we had a group of prostitutes that lived on the other end. And so between those two groups, we became friends. I knew them, I talked to them, especially the prostitutes, they was pretty cool. You know, I went and sat on the stoop and they came out in the evenings and I sat down while they was polishing their fingernails and I was trying to check them out because I was thinking, what the hell is this all about, right? Until some older people came and said, hey, don't hang out with them because, I said, because of what? And then it would get silent because we didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about your sexuality. Nobody actually put a name on it. So I started exploring on my own and that word bull dagger just, it was like a dagger in my soul. You know, it's like, what, you know, what the hell is a bull dagger? And what does that, it was so offensive to me. Mm -hmm. So then when I started reading about lesbianism, I said, all the stuff I read about lesbian, they were all white women. Right, right. And again, right. I was like, yeah. You know, these I don't relate to these people because mm -hmm. they're white. So th these people are not talking to me. So mm -hmm. I'm yeah. So I'm not a lesbian. So I didn't inter interpret it as whatever I was was negative. In 1989, I had participated in the National Black Lesbian Leadership Forum in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was an absolutely positive, mind blowing experience to be just being in the in the presence of people who were nationally on the forefront of HIV and AIDS prevention and education. Uh, people who were executive directors of community organizations who were working toward uh, increasing human rights for LGBTQ people. Uh, and I came back to Chicago with a renewed sense of, you know, this was a fight that I was willing to, you know, sink my teeth into. So when the Mundilikin, uh proposal came up, um, I jumped in it. I didn't realize at the time that it was going to be co-chairing with Karen Hutt. There were a lot of organizations back then. Um, and I had mentioned this to Magdio before that, you know, there was your HIMBA, uh, my group, African-American uh, 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 Women's Alliance. Um, there was a group that Edna had. Blabs, remember? Blabs. 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 Right? Together. Right? Oh, there were just so many groups yeah, back we, then. Ellie. Ellie. Yeah, I was yes, a, literary I was exchange. Okay. <laughs> there were, yeah. We had group dialogue. There was another group, group dialogue, book forum. Book forum. Yeah. But there was another right. group uh, that Ernest had. Ernest, uh, Ernest uh, had. Uh, yes, yeah, Ernest Ellie. Height. Yeah. He and had, his partner. Uh, um, Image Plus. Image right. Plus. Right, 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 yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. I think what Lisa's point is there was a lot of groups, but nobody had taken that step yet. That's right. We were existing in communities, right? Um, but it was very quiet in many ways, right? It was, you know, again, where it could be ignored, right? Or perhaps tolerated. So there was a meeting that took place at the Uptown National Bank building on Lawrence and Broadway. And these people came together to brainstorm ideas on how to increase visibility in the black community for black LGBTQ people. Uh, at that meeting that Karen Hutt introduced the idea of marching in the Mobilican Parade. It was actually, the first meeting was on the north side. The second right. meeting was at the University of Chicago. 
And that's the meeting right. Karen Karen called me and told me to come to that meeting. That's when she dropped that bomb. And the reason she dropped the bomb, she felt like we were grasping for it. Well, the group was grasping for ways something to do to 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 show up. At first, I mean, the room went up because people were scared. I saw people who were supposed to be leadership in our community who I knew were not really leadership in our community. The group was divided and became the ad hoc committee of proud black lesbians and gays. First thing on the agenda, marching in the Bud Billigan Parade. As the thing began to kind of get its own steam, Karen reached out to me because she wanted to make sure there was another person standing with her who would be willing to be on camera. I was asked to deal with the communication aspect. I was asked to talk about the issue, what we were doing. We had a script. So Lisa and I and Karen basically tackled uh, the press. And then there was a submission of the two right and we kept that a secret for a very long time yes. so outside of the group that really was not known so that was like the trump card that we were going to play right because the response had come back you know for the one group right uh, which was the proud black lesbians and gays, there was no space for them, right? They had, they were, they, they were at capacity. Late. Late. We submitted too late. Right. But the reality was we submitted first. It was sent in um, at least a week. At least a week ahead of the other one. Yeah. Which was uh, the day before the, the deadline. It was before the deadline. They had to do like a return on it. It was sent okay. with a return, registered mail. Registered mail Right, so there was no question they had received it. We knew when it had been received because it was stamped, right? So, and then the other application that went in was a little crumply. Um, it was late. And I got it notarized at the lo local currency exchange, the community bank. <laughs> right, <laughs> and that one was accepted, right? And so we held that data until the day of the press conference, you know, saying to folks, we want to tell you what has happened. Um, we, you know, use the classic civil rights um, tool, which is to submit two different applications. And so we said, we've done something similar. We submitted two applications, exact same name, except that we say on one. The African-American role models. Right, like, African-American role what models. What are you gonna do? We're gonna dress as nurses and doctors and carry briefcases. <laughs> something like that. Ad hoc committee of proud black lesbians and gays, right? That one sent registered mail, sent on time. Second one's crumbled, uh, barely on, it probably was late, but accepted, right? Yeah, yeah. And so the, the everybody that was part of the team was primed to say, oops, there it is. <laughs> the group devised a public strategy to pressure the parade officials to grant permission, but it wasn't without controversy. The gays and lesbians community doesn't have to teach teach uh, my grandchildren about uh, uh, being gay and lesbian. And this is the first time I've heard this from a caller, uh, and Ted mentioned that he was going to keep his grandson from coming to the parade because of the participation from the ad hoc committee for proud black and gay lesbians. What about that? But our VON, they called us everything but a child of God, okay? Because it was a call-in participatory show. And the, and the majority of persons who I had been communicating with for all this time turned on me. I actually worked for the commission under Chris Wood, so I, we didn't want to seem duplicitous and we didn't want to seem like we had a plant. So my role was to be kind of invisible and not to be out forward because, like they said, they wanted to know who we were. Now, as an arbitrary citizen, they couldn't stop me from marching. But as an inside person, they could say, well, we had a plant. You all, you all set this up. And we definitely did not want that to go against us. So I understood my role was to zip it and shut up. You know, again, all kind of letters in here, um, people writing to sense that thing, do the right thing, be on the right side of history. You know, I think it is really important um, to honor his memory and legacy because what he wanted to do was sit down and talk with us 
face to face, right? I mean, he wanted to understand. He wanted to know why. We talked to him about James Baldwin. We talked to him about L Lorraine Hansberry. How these, like, pe they were people, they were his peers. And those people meant something to us, right? Those were mo role models that we looked to and others looked through. And so we don't want to be denied as part of our community. Well, they, you know, put the question out, why do you want to be on this parade? This is a back to school parade. Right. You know, you have Anheuser Bush. Right, right. Marching in this parade or having a float in this parade. These kids are too young to drink. You have Philip Morris right. with a float in this parade. Right. These kids are not, you know, old enough to smoke. Why are you promoting these types of behaviors to kids? Uh, his children, his grandchildren, if they're young toddlers, I got the impression they were very young. Uh, they may not even be able to read the name of the sign as we walk by. And they will look at the reaction of the parents commenting about this group as it walks by and i think what they will do is question it's how this grandparent or this grandmother or this parent is going to respond to these kids queries that's going to make a difference on july 29th 1993 the ad hoc committee of proud black lesbians and gays and the chicago defender charities reached a mutual agreement and proud black lesbians and gays will be marching in the 64th annual bud billigan parade on august 14th 1993. I remember taking a ride down King Drive prior to the parade mm -hmm. and just looking at all the places where somebody could be hiding during the parade. This was before you know the proliferation of, of cell phones. Uh, but I had a Motorola brick, yep. one of those field packs yep. <laughs> oh, with a big antenna. So I had, you know, I had that carried with me just in case. We had people who had cars who were parked along the parade route. I said, if anything jumps off, I'm going to call you. You're going to bring your car. And I don't care if you got to crash the parade route. You can bring that car to the parade <laughs> route and we go jump in and we go right out of here. So I definitely, the night before the parade, one of my friends and neighbors came to my house and she she told me she thought we were crazy for going to the parade and and, and I didn't live in Hyde Park I lived in the hood okay in the hood and Hyde Park two different things in the hood wood, wood. yeah they, they'll get you right and so she was standing in front of my house it was quiet I knew that the neighbors were listening although they were pretending to be asleep <laughs> and she started blaspheming and saying I don't think you ought to go and you know you outing us and I'm like what the and, and I told her, I said, I will whoop your ass right here tonight. <laughs> I said, how? Because she lived in Hyde Park. So she could have had that conversation in Hyde Park. Right. But she didn't choose to have it in Hyde Park. She came to me. Who was that? Uh, Karen. Karen. The other Karen. The other Karen. She came oh, to my house. No, oh. short Karen. Uh, and was talking loud about this. Oh. And, and, and I told her, I said, I will kick your ass up and down shields. the street. Shields. Yeah, shields. If you don't shut up, because how dare you? If oh, we're in front of your building, right. where there's a mixed community and right. people are a little more uh, uh, easy about this, it's a different thing. But I'm in the hood, and tomorrow I got to get up and take me and my kid to school. And you're out here trying to blast me about being a homosexual, which you are, okay? <laughs> no, baby, it don't work like that. So I might as well throw down and whoop your ass right now. <laughs> you know, so I, I went into the parade with that kind of feeling and with that kind of antagonism and understanding, this was no small thing. This was about us. I say the night before the parade, I took those flyers and I went to every bar that I thought they were black people. I, put, I hung posters up, said, come out and meet us here. And I handed things to people who often threw things on the ground in front of me. And I just had to keep going. I was so tired and exhausted. I got to bed about one o'clock. The next morning, it was my, I took, I took this on as my responsibility to call people and tell them to meet us. I called people that were just really pissed off at me because, you know, every, they were afraid. Right. And I was, I, 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 they told me that later. Right. But right. I was calling them and, and I was just getting hung up on, I was getting cursed out, um, but I just had to keep going. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel proud at that time. That's right. I just felt like it's something I got to do. That experience really allows me to continue to support next generations of young folk because that seemed radical at the time. Now that seems commonplace now. 
And so when I hear hell, that's Peyton now, right? It, right? It, <laughs> it, right? But when I hear my peers, right, folks that are sixty and older, complaining about Black Lives Matters and the other groups, I'm like, really? Come on now, let's just were your were our elders very pleased with our behavior and how we decided to proceed no we and and that's why it's important to talk about there were a group of leaders a group of elders people we loved jackie was not in support she said why you got to mess with the babies that's the babies parade but jackie they letting them show cigarettes they letting them show budweiser uh they popping their coochie. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. yeah. And so what about that, Jackie? We're not any of that. We're not a negative in our community. And Jackie was big as life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Butch yeah. out. Yeah. Doing everything. Separatist. Teaching. Separatist. Mm -hmm. yes. Nationalist. Mm -hmm. Teaching. Down. You know, at one of the city colleges openly. But yet, felt that what we were doing was wrong. If we had gone, we were going too far for that elder. And that's what Karen told me. Karen Shield said, "You know, I can go along with the Black Panther, but what you're doing is ridiculous." And I said, "What the? I can how to, could that be? You know, I mean, okay. So she said, I can support the Black Panther, but I can't support Black gays. What's the difference?" Well, so our friends. We saw people that we worked with. We saw people that we, uh, who were part of our family. And there was no problem at all. It was just, it was an exhilarating feeling finally being in the Bud Billiken Parade. And especially being in the Bud Billiken Parade as I am, and that is a gay man. I just remember walking down the route and this lady was just cheering and cheering because I think of the band that was marching in yep, front of us. And then, and then she looked and saw the sign and looked at us and she was like, she had this really puzzled look on her face yeah. like, what the hell? And then she said, oh, go ahead. You know, go ahead, kids. Go, baby. <laughs> yeah, go, right. Baby. Sure did. Go, That's baby. right. You sure did. I remember that. Oh, what I was like, <laughs> oh, wow. After two hours of discussion, the group was worn out. But I wanted to ask one final question before we ended the night. What does it feel like to march now, 30 years later? The first time around in 93, I was hiding because of my character and my shining. And this time gave me the opportunity to recapture and to claim my participation in this. And I guess it doesn't matter that I wanted to be in the front part of the parade, trust me, as, as Shelton. Um, but this is not just, it's, it's a closing of a chapter, but it's an opening of another one. Mm -hmm. So I am proud to be with these people who are still here and still doing the work. But they're also um, challenging me to do the work and I, now I'm, I'm here for it. We're going through a lot of changes right now and I feel like we're at the precipice of, precipice of change right now in history as a species. And so I think it's really important, regardless to what else I do, I have made my mark, I have stood up, I have made my ancestors proud of me. I'm going tomorrow and I'm gonna feel damn good about it, regardless to what happens and how many people see me. So even though we feel like nobody might be watching, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, somebody gonna snatch this little snippet out and it's gonna be all over. And they're gonna be saying, who? What were their names again? I never heard of them, you know what I mean? I don't feel like we'll be obscure. I feel like we're closing a chapter. We are staking our, our we, we, we just came through COVID and survived it. We, we a hell of a group of warriors. So my participation in this 30th anniversary, I'm, I'm happy to be marking a milestone where the community has come up, come into its own and knowing that we had some hand in that. However, it's very important that we still create this visibility because we are in an unprecedented time where our rights are being attacked again. And we need to make sure 
that people keep in the forefront of their minds that we are still part of the community, we're still parts of your family, and that it's not just a fight that we have to fight, but the whole community needs to be involved in this fight. And what happens in you know Florida, what's happening in Texas and other parts of the country, we can't forget how far we've come and how far we've yet to go. It is a huge milestone. Um, I think it is very important for, in particular, young folks to see us. And again, I think we also give them a sense of what's possible, right? So we were in their space at one point, and now we're in a different phase of life, right? And so that that really is about possibility. Um, and so for all of those reasons, I think it's very important. And simultaneously, uh, I am disappointed um, that the Defender Charities didn't seek us out. Um, they found us, in fact, by accident. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm disappointed by that. I'm disappointed by the fact that once they did find us, they didn't truly open up communication um, and create the space um, for the celebration for them as well. Because this is also an important anniversary for them uh, that should be acknowledged, should be talked about. It could mean so much, again, a continuation of that dialogue that was started with the grandfather 30 years ago could have could be continuing, right? Um, and so I, I'm disappointed and sad for the lost opportunity. Um, and, and so I'm going into it a, a little bit with that sadness and disappointment um but definitely you know seeing jano and uh was not expecting to see stephanie that is you know seeing shelton that definitely has uh um brightened it all up for me um and really has done my heart good um and so i'm really looking forward to being with them tomorrow um and celebrating on Saturday, August 12th, the Chicago Black LGBTQ plus group will make history as they commemorate the 30th anniversary of their original 1993 entry into the Bud Billigan Parade. That year, the denial of their original request and the public conversation that followed was talked about from Ted Koppel's Nightline, USA Today, to WVON Radio. 30 years older and a little more weary from the cost, the marchers will be riding in the trolley with joyful pride.